All right. I have to go to script. So we've, we've heard about some of the issues with cross-platform campaign effectiveness. Now we're going to ask Charles Buckwalter, the president and CEO of Symphony Advanced Media. Rob's going to stay on, on stage, Rob Jason, uh, and they're going to update you on an improvement that Sim and Sam have been pilot testing. Gentlemen. So uh, I just want to introduce this, this study. Uh, Zenith has uh, been very pleased uh, to be a part of helping to get this, this study uh, underway. Uh, and we think these results are, are initial but very, hel very helpful for us. Uh, and what Charles is going to talk about really, is really set up by the white paper that Jane and, and uh, uh, Sim put forward that talked about the problems of current measurement uh, and about ad research. Uh, and the four issues that were really set up in that white paper uh, that started to outline why we wanted to look at alternatives. Uh, you know, issues like the fact that, that things were measured in different ways, uh, whether we're looking at immediate, uh, copy, uh, immediate consumer response uh, in online advertising or, or up to a week's delay when we start to look at recall from, from TV, um, whether we're looking at uh, you know, whether, how we measure for people who wipe out their cookies, how we allow for different sample sizes, uh, how we allow for different kinds of, of uh, sample sizes that we get when surveys are, are over long. All of these things meant that our measurement uh, wasn't, wasn't entirely uh, where we'd like it. And, and I think that white paper set it up very well. And I think we're going to go through some of the results that, that we've, uh, you know, we're very pleased to have seen from this, this survey. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. And it's, it's fantastic to be here. Uh, there's a reason we're starting with this white paper, two reasons. The first one is it's fantastic. And so if any of you haven't read it, go to the SIM site. Uh, it's really one of the better papers on the pluses and minuses of current approaches to cross-media ad effectiveness. But the other reason we're doing it is I think it has a lot to do with why Symphony Advanced Media exists today and why Jane uh, chose to work with us on a pretty great project. Uh, I'm going to bring your attention to the quote at the bottom of this slide, um, I don't need to go through it in too much detail, but what uh, Michelle and Catherine actually did say in the white paper is that they thought that single source passive media approaches to measurement could address many of the issues that were highlighted in the paper and that Rob just summarized. And what I'm going to do right now is just spend a little bit time setting up, introducing who we are, why we're doing what we're doing, and then I'm going to lead you into the results that we went through with the project we worked on with Jane. Um, we basically, as a result of this quote uh, from the white paper, we, we kind of took it as a challenge. You know, one of the things uh, they say is that single source passive measurement isn't going to be available in the near term. And, and we took that as a challenge, and that's what Symphony Advanced Media set out to do. And we started with two premises. The first premise was, if we were going to do cross-media measurement, we wanted to use a mobile device as the mechanism to meter people's cross platform usage. And the second thing we did is we came up with an app, an application technology that would be resident on the mobile devices of our panelists. And I'll just spend a couple of minutes on this slide because it kind of leads you through how the app works in terms of tracking passively cross-media measurement. We actually started, when, when clients come up and they become panelists, we ask them for their Facebook permissions. We were shocked how many gave it to us. And so we start off by having loads of data on people's social interaction, their likes, their posts, comments, all of this kind of information, which allows us to come up with a social segmentation. The next thing the app did, it's resonant on smartphones, Android or iOS devices. It works indefinitely in the background. So we have the ability of tracking everything people are doing on their smartphones. The next step was how do we tackle TV? And we tackled TV through an automatic content recognition play. So if you're at home watching Modern Family, the ambient noise from Modern Family gets converted to a code, and it's matched to a reference database. So on a second-by-second, minute-by-minute basis, we are able to track what programs people are watching. And then we did those three first because they were kind of cutting edge, and we didn't understand them exactly. We wanted to get our arms around them. And we left the online one, which most of us at Symphony Advanced Media came from the online world. So we are using, and we're at the final stages of putting this together, a proxy-based VPN solution to track at the granular level what video ads, what search, what URLs people are going to. And so the idea here 
TV, mobile, social, web, all in a single source passive basis. This is what we do at Symphony Advanced Media. Now, this is just kind of an example of the, of the information that comes out of our system. So I know you can't see all the URLs here, but uh, this is on our site, it's on Sim's site, you can get this report. What we have across the top, this is, uh, you know, we have app phone, Facebook, web browser, TV, email, and texting. And the idea is this is actually just 10 minutes of a random panelist on December 3rd from 11 to 11.10 a.m. in the morning. And you can see, well, you can't see, but I'll tell you, uh, they were watching, of all things, The Price is Right. And that's the green column. They were watching TV for this entire 10 minutes. But it chronicles all the other things that these users are doing. Now, the reason I loved Natasha's presentation so much, and I don't know if she's still here. Uh, I think she may have left. But, um, that, you know, if you think about her user segmentations, the content grazing, uh, all of that, with our data, we have the ability of kind of matching those kinds of segmentations. If you want to know people that are watching TV, that happen to be texting at the same time, we have all the granular data to be able to do that. So this is the kind of data that is coming out of our system that our clients increasingly are tapping into. Now, lead, a, a couple of slides leading into the methodology that we used for the study that was commissioned by SIM. Uh, the question is, how does passive opportunity to see television work in our system? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward, starting on the top left here. Our panelists are watching TV. As I mentioned earlier, let's say they're watching Modern Family. What happens is that on a second-by-second -second basis, matches are being made between the codes, the reference database, and it shows up on the cell phone. Uh, and what we are able to get on a pretty granular basis is the show watched, channel viewed, date and time of, uh, of broadcast, and we keep it for seven days. And so even if someone watches it three days later on a DVR, we have the ability to match. Now, in all candor, there's some good news and some bad news. I mean, it's not a perfect solution, but it's pretty darn good. Uh, on the good side, uh, it tracks an individual, not household, individuals within a household. Out of home works extremely well. Many of us happen to be at bars, we happen to be outside, and the ACR works extremely well, even in those situations. No panelist interaction and no additional action whatsoever. It's an entirely passive thing. There are some challenges. Uh, if the ambient noise gets to be too loud, you're going to have some interruption. If you happen to actually use your smartphone as a phone, which people do do from time to time, um, uh, that's going to interrupt. Uh, and, you know, the one thing we do with compliance with our panelists, we say, look, all you need to do, you don't have to do anything with the app, just have the phone on and have it be near the TV when you're watching TV. Uh, obviously, if, if, the car, if the phone is off and left in the garage in the car, not going to work. Uh, so those are some of the pluses and minuses. Um, now, so the question is, how do we match ad exposure? Now, what we did for the purposes of the SIM study, this is an approach that many of you have done, so it's not really rocket science. Uh, we have the ability on the left, in terms of uh, looking at law and order uh, at 8.50 p.m., well, of course, we have the Canthar data, so we know exactly at that time what ad ran. So we have the ability of doing that overlay and doing that match. So we know if people were exposed to the program at a certain time, they had the ability to be exposed to the ad. So that's how we handled it uh, uh, from the TV standpoint. And from the online standpoint, and I'm going to kind of clarify this a little bit later in the presentation, what we did for the purpose of this study is we tagged the ad campaigns, which gave us the ability to know who was exposed and who wasn't. We're graduating to a more advanced uh, solution that we're excited about over the next six to eight weeks. So with that all as background, uh, what did SIM want to do? And I think that the big question is, is that as we mentioned earlier, People have been waiting quite a long time for single source passive measurement. And the hypothesis is, is that true passive measurement is going to advance the industry's knowledge of how things like ad effectiveness work. And that's really what we were testing. So uh, what happened with us, we, we got involved with SIM um, in July and August of last year. And we went through the fall building our panel. Now, I, I didn't mention this earlier. We started our panel just about a year ago, and the panel, as we, as we started working with SIM, 
panel wasn't as large as we would have liked it to be. It was between two and 3,000, but our plan was to grow it significantly as we uh, got through the year. We, we ended the year at around 9,000 panelists, and we're between nine and 10,000 panelists, and that's what we used for the SIM study. Um, late in the year, we were able to work with uh, three agencies, and we had one CPG campaign, we had a wireless telecom campaign, and we had a pharma campaign. And that information was given to us, and they started pretty much all in January. Some went through Valentine's Day, some went past to late February, and actually one of the campaigns is actually still in process. So um, here are some summary stats, the post-campaign survey statistics, because one of the things that you know from our panel is not only do we have the ability of getting all the quantitative data from the panel, but you have the ability of surveying all the panelists at the same time. So the post-campaign results were as follows. You can see that in brand one, we had about 475 completes, 701, 783. There's actually two points on this uh, chart that I think deserve notice. The first one is up above how many smartphone, how many people on smartphones and tablets actually completed the surveys. Uh, it, was, it was a pretty significant amount. And if you look down below, I think this is something that we're particularly, we didn't expect, and it was kind of an aha moment for us. If you look across the survey completion rates, these are people that actually completed the surveys, that started the survey and completed them, the completion rates was in the high 80% or low 90%, and it was across online, smartphone, and, and tablet. Now, a couple of things uh, as we thought about this. One of our findings in this study is we do think the passive measurement contributed significantly to this. You know, the idea that because passively you're learning a lot of stuff that you don't have to ask questions about, you could end up with a, a survey that lasts maybe five or six minutes and a reduced set of questions. And the feeling is, is that with that reduced set of questions, you were able to get a very high completion rate across the board. I have to make a shout out to our partner, Vision Critical. We think they did a fantastic job. We've worked with a few survey vendors in this process, and one of the things they've done exceptionally well is take surveys that typically have been only on PCs, and they converted them to mobile and uh, tablet experiences that were really excellent. And so that contributed also to the high completion rates, we think. So what were some of the top line measures uh, we looked at in the study? Well, one of the very big debates in the industry is passive better than survey-based ad recognition, OTS versus ad recognition. And one of the things that we wanted to, to zero in in the study is, you know, which one works? Do they work in combination? What, what did the numbers show? And then, of course, a number of passive TV uh, and online versus stated TV and online, mostly through ad recognition. These are the kinds of stats we were looking at as we moved through. Now, as I mentioned, there were three different campaigns. Here's an example of one of the campaigns. Uh, and you can see this happened to be one of the larger campaigns. Uh, there were on TV about 438 GRPs and the online impressions about 165 million. This happens to be the campaign that was very much a Valentine's Day oriented campaign. So you can see that the online impressions peaked around Valentine's Day. The TV peaked a little bit before. Uh, and in this, this is the one that had a sample size of 701. Uh, there were 249 panelists exposed to TV only, but then it reduced a bit as we went to online and online only. Now, this slide I'm going to spend a little bit of time on uh, because I think it highlights some of the key findings that came out of the study. And it really gets to the core. Uh, our belief uh, as a result of this is that you need both passive views of the opportunity to see in conjunction with survey-based ad recognition. And without both together, you have this very confusing thing of understanding why do you have certain results? And I think that the idea that there's pollution in test and control, this is one of the key findings in the Medansky and Kegel white paper, that, that these test and control definitions have been very confused and have been fraught with all sorts of difficulty. We believe that as you start separating out the pollution, you have the ability of getting to a much more refined and accurate view of lift. Uh, getting to Don's question about is it exp exposure or impact, when you want to refine your view of impact, we believe that a passive 
measurement gives you a huge amount of information that you can put in conjunction with survey. So in this particular example, and this was from one of the brands, uh, you can see that as you move from left to right, the very first thing you have is were they exposed or were they not exposed passively? This is the opportunity to see. And then as you move to the ad recognition questions, which are always the very last questions in our surveys, you have the ability of separating out the people who truly were exposed and the people who truly weren't exposed, separating out the false positives and the false negatives, which happen to be red on this slide. And when you look at that, you're able to come up with what we call an adjusted control and an adjusted exposed that we believe moves things ahead considerably. So this is something that we saw across all the campaigns. It was a little more in full Technicolor than others. Uh, some of the smaller campaigns, it was a little difficult, but we saw evidence of this across the board. Now, you know, that happened to be very much focused on the TV side of things, but this was a cross-media exercise. Now, having said that, you know, I think that while we love the three campaigns we had, we would have preferred larger campaigns and something a little bit more. The campaigns were TV and online. None of the campaigns actually had mobile. We actually are engaging with a number of clients that have TV, online, and mobile right now, but not in this study. But w there are a couple of things on this slide that kind of look at the cross-media impact. Uh, when you look at the people that were exposed to TV only, and then you move to the right and you see people that were exposed to both TV and online, there was definitely lift in some of the top funnel numbers. Unaided awareness, favorability, and consideration definitely bumped up by having these campaigns synergistically working together in TV and online. Uh, at the bottom of this chart, you actually have stats that come straight out of our app, which have to do with the amount of time people are spending co-viewing. Uh, and this is, I don't know if many of you caught uh, my colleague Mike Saxon's presentation a month ago at the ARF, uh, but he zeroed in on this issue of attraction versus distraction of co-viewing. Uh, it's a great, uh, you know, the, you wouldn't believe which TV shows people were actually spending more time in other TV shows, and we can uh, give you some information on that later. But what I do here is bring your attention to kind of the bottom line here, which is, the amount of time, the percentage of time people are actually spending on their mobile phone when they're actually being exposed to a TV ad. Once again, it's one of the beauties of our system that because we have this app that's working around the clock, we know exactly when people are seeing an ad and we know what they're doing on their mobile phones and their tablets and, and where they're going on the mobile phones and tablets when they're doing that. And what this shows is for those that are exposed to TV only, 35% of the time that they're viewing an ad, they're actually on their mobile phone. And that the number was similar when they, they were exposed to both TV and online together. And what we've done is we kind of go into this in a little more depth on this particular slide here, uh, concurrent use of mobile devices and TV. Uh, if you kind of go from right to left on this chart, on the right you basically have the number of hours per week for people watching TV that people aren't exposed to the ad. The middle one is the amount of time people are actually are, spend, uh, are exposed to an ad. And then on the far left, you see the average percent of time that people are on their mobile phones when they're viewing an ad. And there's a few interesting things that come out of this slide. The first one is the numbers seem to indicate that the more time people spend uh, watching TV, the more time they spend watching ads. That kind of makes sense. But it also says that the more time people are spending on their mobile phone when they're watching the ads. And it's a critical finding, and we want to make, you know, we, we need to study this a lot more. It doesn't necessarily mean that people are turning away from commercials. Uh, it actually might mean the opposite. But what it means is while they're watching commercials, uh, they're, they're actually on their mobile phones doing, you know, doing something related, doing something else. You know, when I talk to a number of my friends at some of the big broadcast firms, this is kind of a common knowledge that appears to be emerging, and that is co-viewing or concurrent viewing of devices keeps people away from the remote. And people kind of like that because even if they might not have full attention on the ad, the ad is still there. So I'm not going to say that we study that in detail. It's something that deserves much more analysis, but we think it's an interesting finding. So. Uh, by means of summary, um, 
where we came out of the study, and, and this study, as I think I mentioned earlier, it's on the SIM site, it's on our site. Um, passive measurement improves the practicality of cross-media measurement. I mentioned the higher survey response rates, uh, and we're moving towards a technology that will eliminate tagging altogether. Uh, limited overlap between online and TV campaigns. Uh, it shows multiple platforms are important. This is something that Aaron and the panel just talked about earlier. Uh, online and TV exposure together drive a synergistic response. That's been proven by many before us, but this study also showed that. And then TV ad viewers typically spent 30 to 40 percent of ad viewing time using a mobile device. Um, I think related to what we were hired to do by SIM, I think the key point here is that OTS passive exposure in combination with survey-based ad recognition, in our view, is the way to go. Either one alone isn't going to get you to where you need, but if you combine them together in the way that we did by taking our passive tracking and then using our panelists, surveying them, and finding the right way to ask ad recognition questions, together you have a unique way of cleaning your test and control uh, buckets. Now, what's next for us? Uh, there are a few things that are coming ahead with our Media Pulse product. First of all, goes without saying, we want to grow our panel so that we can, can look at smaller and more complex campaigns. Uh, I mentioned earlier that for the purposes of this study, we tagged online campaigns, which all of you do right now. We are actually launching a new version of our app that's going to be a proxy-based VPN that's going to allow us, without any cookies, to track every ad URL, search URLs, et cetera, and track all of these things. And we think that's going to dramatically, uh, you know, it's going to add to the passive nature of everything that we're doing. Uh, some very interesting work in the ad replacement area. People refer to this oftentimes in the area of copy testing, but the ability of having a way to kind of zero in on the uh, kind of an experimental design approach, zeroing in on the benefits and costs of different ads. We're going to be doing that and continuing to expand our social media coverage. And then one of the things we just launched last week uh, is we're continually seeking new ways to expand our panel recruiting. And we just entered a deal with one of the leading wireless carrier providers, and we have negotiated in return for a number of lines that we've committed to them. They're giving us a very deep discount on monthly service fees that we can pass on to our panelists. And so the whole idea, you know, panelist, uh, panel creation can eat you alive. Uh, many of you know this, and it certainly happened to us to some extent. We think this approach is going to allow us to dramatically grow our panel at a significantly reduced cost. And so we're, uh, we're, we're keeping our fingers crossed that that, that, that works out. So uh, before I uh, move on and introduce to the, uh, to the next speaker, I'd like to just start by thanking Jane. Uh, Jane, it's been a pleasure working with you and all the SIM um, members. Uh, we couldn't have done this without you. I also want to do a shout out to the three agencies that worked with us, uh, MediaVest, uh, Zenith, and the folks at Universal McCann. We couldn't have done these campaigns without you. Uh, so anyway, we're looking forward to kind of moving ahead. Now, last thing I'm going to say, this table right here has a few of my colleagues from Symphony Advanced Media. Since we're not going to have time for questions now, we'll all be here during the cocktails. So if you want to learn more about what we've, how we've done this or where we're going, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, so with that, I'm going to thank you, and I'm going to now introduce the next speaker. Uh, I'd like to